Ben, you ready? I am most ready. <laughs> Everyone else is ready? Okay, cool. Hello and welcome to this very special live episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name is Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. He's my podcasting partner for going on 13 years. <laughs> He's the man I love. It's Ben Ainsley. Hi, Ben. I like that. The man I love. I hope I hope we can make that true in some sort of on the down low sense where, where, <laughs> where there's a there's, there's an illicit love affair that has been going on for far too long. We must tell people, Daniel. Have I not said that we'll know that we've really made it when we start seeing slash fiction? Mm, mm -hmm. When people start shipping us, yes. that's how you know. When there's a significant AO3 presence of Daniel and Ben, that's that's when you know you've you've mm. really cracked into the cultural zeitgeist. And I don't, I don't mind that. Although we've been very clear about our chemistry, so that's you know, not, <laughs> yeah. not an issue. It's, it's not will they, won't they? It's like how many times will they? <laughs> how many times? And when you say how many times, you're talking about how many times we've done one of these word of the year shows, word of the week of the year shows. I think we've done like nine or ten. That was a stupendous segue out of verdant sexual really congress awkward, into I... what the show is doing. That was very impressive. You're a maestro, a wizard, sir. I managed to turn it around. I don't think anybody noticed. <laughs> um, our pal Hedvig will not be here for this one, sadly, because she, like five minutes ago, she was like, I am super duper sick and I cannot make it. And I said, Hedvig, we love you. It will be fine. You get better. And we will, you know, the important thing is your health. So you just, you just take it easy. So she's just, she's just taking it easy, but we're going to miss her. Joke's on her. This is one of the like three shows a year that was actually conducted at a time that suits her. So it's like <laughs> the afternoon in Germany and Hedvig, hashtag, not a morning person usually. And she mm -hmm. always gets stuck with 9am shows. So uh, sorry, Hedders, you, this is one of the three actually nice for you shows that you can't do. I feel really bad for you. Everybody get onto Discord and just pelt her with lovely get well messages after this episode. So what's coming up in this episode? We're looking at all the words of the week of the year. We're looking at all the words of the year from everyone who releases a word of the year. We've got dictionary bodies, lexicography bodies in English and in other languages, but we're also going to be counting down our words of the week of the year. Our listeners and our friends have voted and we'll be hashing out those results. Oh, makes me feel good. Who can wait? You've, you've all got all of your seats, but you'll only need their edge. I think I used mm. that in a previous. <laughs> Someone who's like just working through all of the of the years in a row would be like, "Oh, Ben, you <laughs> hack." That's why you have transcripts. How many times has Ben made that joke? Oh, oh, no, that's oh, that's a terrible use of money, making me look stupid. This episode comes in audio format and also video on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, that's great, but you can also swap over to video on YouTube because you'll be able to see us and. You'll be able to see all the messages and reactions that are happening in chat, which is fun. If you're watching us on YouTube, maybe think about throwing us a like so that the almighty algorithm will show us to more people. Let's see. We are joined by a good many patrons. I want to hear uh, a gaggle. Where are you coming from tonight? Where is, every, where is everybody? Do you want to just tell us where you are? Drop it in chat and we'll we'll read some out because that's We've fun. Let's see. At least what's five by five? Twenty five. Oh We've got gosh. at least 25 and there's a there's another page apparently, but the Zoom doesn't do pages in a way that makes sense to me. So I think there's like another column. So there's maybe 30. Nathaniel checking in from Hong Kong. Anika from Boston. That's early. Cass, you're in New Mexico. That's even earlier. Prize for Diego in LA. He's on the worst coast. It's the coast <laughs> that I love, but I've got to say it's the hardest one to get right for these shows. Copenhagen from Magdalena. Termi from Melbourne. Aria, who are the who are my Perth people? We've got Pharaoh Cat right here and Aria Flame in Boru. Nigel in Miami. Ben, take over. Oh, sorry. Yes. We've got Munster, which I am absolutely sure that I pronounce correctly and definitely won't get in trouble for. We've got um some some someone checking. We got Louise checking in from Ontario. 
which is great. Southwest Washington State. I really like, oh, Colleen, man. that you specified Southwest because the Northwest, Northeast, and Southeast can all die in a hole, apparently. The Southwest, though. Mm. Wait a minute. I happen to come from a small town in eastern Washington, and I can tell you that it can definitely die in a hole. <laughs> Why does everyone from Spokane hate Spokane <laughs> so much? It is unreal. If I had time, I would run and get a t-shirt that I got last time I was in Spokane. It says, Spokane, we tried. <laughs> I just, I loved that energy. Uh, we've got Aaron in Troy, Michigan. We've got, I can't read everybody. Cara from Oregon, you win the prize. Very good. So many people, Lisa from Perth. Oh, so good to have all of you. Also, thank you to all the Australian Eastern Staters for being here. It's great to see you. All right. I just like to say thanks to all you patrons. You're able to join us on this live episode because you are patrons, and that's just one of the perks that you get from being a patron. What else we got? Discord? Discord is great. Oh, no, not that we need to sell it to the people who are currently like here, because obviously they're all from the Discord, which is a great yep. community. But if you're listening to this later... All of the cool kids are there, and so you should be there too. Our annual mail out is coming as well. So the bit of housekeeping, we're, we're, I, I've ordered a few of the items. We're going to be tucking them into a little envelope soon. Postcards, stickers, including the new one, the etymology sticker, which Aristamo granted us, and I have turned it into artwork, and that's coming. Some more surprises. So if you want the package, make sure the Patreon has your mailing address. There are lots of patrons for whom that field is empty, and that's too bad because I've got no idea how to get the annual mail out to you, and you're going to want it because it's really fun. And if you are watching this and you're not a patron, there's still time. Go to patreon.com slash because lang pod. All right. Goodies. You ready to get those words? I am. I am frothing for the <laughs> words. Frothing. Okay. We're going to start with the ones from other dictionary bodies and it always seems to be Collins that starts out they kind of go early and they chose one that I thought was going to be a big one and it was it's AI yeah okay that's it's the safe bet it's the real safe bet yeah this one was based on a committee pick they get together and they say what what should be the word and they chose AI ever since chat GPT came out in November of 2022 so a little over a year ago people have been thinking a lot about artificial intelligence, which, as we know from our episode with Emily Bender back in, I think, July or August, artificial intelligence doesn't exist. Software is not intelligent. It's just doing patterns. And we're doing patterns, but we're also doing extra stuff. But it can do seemingly intelligent and useful things. But of course, we've, we've got to watch out for those things that it can do and not over-rely on it. So AI, that's the one from Collins. Now, the one from the Australian National Dictionary Center was Matilda. Ben, why? Because of our national female soccer team. Although, I've got to be honest, it does feel like now we should probably clarify in the opposite direction in mm -hmm. Australia when you're talking about the national soccer team. It, it is a really good bet that you're probably talking about the female team, so we should probably start... Going, oh yeah, the uh, the American, the Australian male soccer team, the whoever's, I, I don't actually know their name. Not because I'm trying to be all like alternative, but because I'm not a oh, sport guy. I don't know them. I, I, I actually don't. Someone in the chat, tell us the Socceroos. It's there we Lord go. Lord Mortis, the Socceroos. <laughs> there Thanks, we go. Lord Thank you. And yeah, there really was for listeners outside of Australia, there really was a kind of moment in Australia during the World Cup where the um, the the soccer team that was participating in the World Cup, the Matildas or the Tillies, as they are affectionately referred to here, um, were just they they were they had a moment. They mm -hmm. they arrived culturally speaking. And when I say they arrived, obviously they've been doing really hard work for a really long time. They didn't like just arrive, but they've certainly arrived in popular consciousness. And so that is not surprising to me that the Matildas or the Tillies, did they, which one did they go with? Was it Matildas or Tillies? It is the Matildas, but oh. uh, colloquially the Tillies, because of course we Australians love our hypocoristics. We love to add E on the ends of our things. <laughs> or O, oh, depending on the things. But the Tillos oh. just sounds wrong. Now, have we have we discussed that one? I'm sure we've discussed it on a different episode. But I feel we like have, we have. We have E endings and we have O endings. And the E endings are for affectionate things, for 
it's it's the lovables, whereas O is for the unlovables. So if you're a muso having a smoke O, there's something a little bit, you know, just I just feel reputable. like that's an imperfect explanation that doesn't jigsaw with my own cultural understandings of my peoples. All right, fine. That's cool. Let me just give you a test though. Did okay. would you rather would you rather meet with your rellies or with your rellos? Yeah, but you don't I mean, first of all, if it's my family, this is a whole different thing, okay? <laughs> but second of all, second of all, bad like example. The, the traino, the bottle o, these are not bad things. These are no, these not, are fine things. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying when something is an o, that one way to look at it is lovables versus unlovables, but another way is um, the O denotes sort of toughness or roughness or okay. maybe masculinity or okay. things like that. And then you got like sparkies and chippies, but I guess that's affectionate. I don't know. I don't know. We'll get, for, for we'll get bogged down in this one and we'll forget about all the words, Daniel. All right, fine. Uh, let's talk instead about uh, Waltzing Matilda. We've all heard ah, the song Waltzing well, Matilda. Perhaps not, not everyone listening has potentially heard it. Um, I, can, I can very, Sing. I can very much imagine. Imagine there's a bunch of people outside Australia being like the what, the the what, the what, the what? now? The, okay, the tango well, of the who? Well, Ben, would you please be the cultural interpreter for those people and tell us? I about tell Waltz you what. Matilda. In fact, in fact, the, oh, okay. Give me fifteen seconds because I'm right adjacent to my son's room. One, like, hold on. <laughs> ben, what are you doing? We we're gonna bring. The, Gonna bring the youngs. Gonna bring the next generation into this. I did it! I did it! I did it! I'm back! I'm back! I'm back! What'd you do? I have in my hand. Yep. A a children's book, uh, which is blurred out because of my stupid background stuff. Which is the Waltzing Matilda song, which was, and I have proof. Yes. Given to me when oh. I was a child, not my son. My goodness. Um. So this is this is how like. Australiana, this shit is. Um, so we're talking in the like the tender days of like the late eighties, and it's all like Australian oil paintings. So like yeah, every yeah, yeah. line of the song is just like that that sort of action. Oh, it's not working very well. Sorry. Ooh, here we go. Oh, there's anyway. a swagman. Once a blurry swagman <laughs> yeah, camped yeah. by a billabong. So I've even got yeah yeah. The once was camped camp by a billabong under the shade of the Coolabar Coolabar tree. tree. And he sang as he looked at his old Billy boiling, who come a waltzing Waltzing Matilda Matilda with me. me. So, okay, that's the song. And it goes on like that. How do you go waltzing Matilda with someone? I I think, I think because this book actually has like a back bit that explains it all. (laughs) It's like you carry a swag, Mm -hmm. which is a, a bedroll in Australian parlance. And so back in the day when people, transient workers were moving from like farm to farm or station to station and chuck their, like it's hobo stuff, right? You'd chuck your bedroll on your shoulder and you'd walk down the road looking for work. And apparently that was waltzing Matilda. The Matilda right. was the swag. Matilda was your swag. That is absolutely correct. And because it was your sleeping partner, it was the thing that you had to keep you warm at night. We also see Maria in this kind of usage. So um, Banjo Patterson, the author of the poem slash song, uh, once wrote, so we shouldered our Matildas and we turned our back on town. You could shoulder your Matilda. You could Matilda up. Uh, if you were a vagrant or an itinerant worker, you could be a Matilda carrier, Matilda lumper, a Matilda man, or a Matilda waltzer. And why waltzing? This is a little speculative, but it it could be that with so many German immigrants, they were using a word, a German word, Walse, which means having a wander, the kind of wander that you have, auf die Walse gehen, gehen, which means to go a wandering. So it's possible that this is a mishearing. The waltz is uh, is a mishearing of the German verb Walse, and I'll I'll take correction. If you're if you're in Germany, please unmute. And let me know. <laughs> we've got we've got actually a couple of uh, people who can weigh in on this one. Please do. If um, no one from Germany wants to answer that question, maybe I'll ask this: um, Does the German word is that not where we get the name for the music, the style of music, to waltz? Don't know. Don't have access. Surely, to a German surely. etymology. It's so it's so close. Ben, we've seen lots of close words. Yeah, that's true. Neighbors, mm. neighbors does not mean cousins. So, up the Tillies. That was a great, <laughs> uh, a great part of Australian history. That was that was a lovely moment. It it really felt like everyone was in on it. By the way, 
when you say up the sports team, you're actually saying go the sports team or come on sports team. So it's it's that's all that is. Okay, the next one, dictionary.com and Cambridge shows the same word, and it was hallucinate. Oh, is this also AI? It is. What okay, do you know cool. about this one? Uh, well, <laughs> just, just uh, as I'm sure, any, look, anyone who has played with the, some of the AI stuff, whether it's the image stuff or the text stuff, um, has probably come across this. I know I certainly have. It just, it just makes stuff up. Sometimes it just completely can fix things that do not exist. Oh, I like that word, confect. I'm going to put that on my list. You see, here's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make a list of words that are better than hallucinate, because as you know from the episode, once again, with Dr. Emily Bender. <laughs> I um, see what you mean, yeah. You can't, me- <laughs> computers can't hallucinate uh, and Annika points out quite rightly that Ben used this last time. I sort of let it go. But hallucinating implies a mental state, and computers don't have them. So there's a hunt on to try to get a better word than hallucinate. I found this tweet from uh, English OER. It's someone named Anna who says, who posts, not hallucination, not fabrication, not confabulation. That's a shame because I liked confabulate. I liked that one. Uh, They continue, we need a word for when LLMs make things up. The word shouldn't imply conscious experience or intent. Discussion with other person helped me find one candidate, concoction. Concoct? I think concoct is, but that's still a bit agenty, isn't it? I liked confect. I still like confabulate. I like them all. I, I imagine if you actually look up confect, I've probably used it wrong, sir. So. But it's sweet and tasty, like candy. <laughs> Aria Flame is correct. <laughs> well, Confabulate th- and concoct also have a similar vibe for me of like mental uh, images. Both of them, I just see like a hunched over wizard man surrounded by like lo- lots of bottles and ingredients. Those are those sorts of words. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, this is hard because we're not good at coming up with verbs that are agentless because we don't live in an agentless world or we're very quick to impute agency to anything, random happenstance things. So it just doesn't show up in our verbs. And so it's really hard to find one that's good. What about Lieberg? Like a like a large language model just carves liebergs, much like a glacier does, <laughs> and then they calve, right? <laughs> they calve and splash into our information ecosystem ocean. That's all right. I love the uh, the suggestions that are coming up. Right? Okay. Thank you all in chat. Let's go to the next one. Miriam Webster has their word of the year: authentic. Based on lookups, a lot of people are looking up authentic this year. Based on okay, so is this also an AI thing? Is this is are we in a stage now where all of the words are like even like responses to AI? It, it sure seems that way, doesn't it? I think wow. that uh, we're trying to figure out what's real and what's synthetic, which is why if you get an email from me, you'll see something at the bottom of my signature. It says this email was written by a human, no synthetic text. And that's, that's just exactly my way of saying what a machine would say. <laughs> oh, sure you would. Well, people deserve to know. And so this is my way of sort of saying, for the record, I'm real. Let's go on to the next one. Macquarie Dictionary. That's an Aussie dictionary. They have chose. Oh, and I know we know some of the people on the committee as well. Um, for example, Tiger Webb, one of our pals who's been on an episode. David Astle, who is a crossword constructor. Ooh. And yeah, David Estel is uh he's great. He was he's also the word guy from Letters and Numbers, if you watch that on SBS. Oh. Anyway, they and other people on the committee chose Cozzy Lives. Cozzy Lives. Cozzy Lives. What, what am I what am I not following here? Oh, we've forgotten that one since the last time this came. The cost of living. Oh, of course it is. Remember of course that? it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like and- a minty bee, that sort of a vibe. A menti B, a locky D. Yeah. Uh, we saw last a couple of years ago with the Queen of England. She had her platy jubes, <laughs> platinum <laughs> jubilee. 
The committee says, although Kazi Libs was coined in the UK, it has resonated soundly with Australians with its E suffix and its clipped formation, reminiscent of Menti B and Lockie D. And what could be a more Australian approach to a major social and economic problem than to treat it with a bit of humor and informality? What do you reckon, Ben? Yeah, that checks out. That's <laughs> I, I'm surprised to hear that it was British in its construction because that's mm-hmm. that reads and feels very Australian. It does, and yet it's also pretty British if you're familiar with that construction. It feels to me, here's here's my take. It feels like they thought the template was interesting, like it's an interesting way of constructing a phrase. So they wanted to highlight that, but they also wanted to pick an example that meant something that they wanted. You can't just pick any weird example. You've got to pick something that you want to communicate. So they went with Causey Lives. I kind of wish that they had gone with Jendi Nooch. <laughs> Nooch. Nooch. There's something, there is something, I don't know. There's, I shudder just a little bit with the, the shortening to Nooch. It okay. feels dirty. I don't know why. Uh, maybe just because it sounds like Gooch. I, I don't know. But it's Jendi Nooch just has a uh, <laughs> something going on there. Now, to be clear. Not, not the actual ne- concept. Yeah, no. gender neutrality, not gross at all. That's great. that's a that's an amazing, great, that's thing, a great thing in the world. Like, I have no issue with that. But gender nooch, I don't know. Ugh. It's the nooch ending. Hey, if people can have an issue with the word moist, which I maintain is a really important word for a couple of usages, mm. right, and there is no good replacement and people get all bent out of shape about that, then I get to be funny about nooch. Mm. Okay. You can. You you took moist well, so we'll we'll give you this one. It's interesting how this gets formed. You know, the first part, the gendi or the menti or whatever, it's two syllables. The last one is always an IE, an E sound. And then the second part is always one syllable, but it's super variable. It could end with a Z sound like Cosy Lives, Platy Jubes, Cory Bobs for the coronation. By the way, I like to call all of these things Cory Bobs. That's the, the name that I'm trying to get started. So it could end in a Z sound. But it could also sound like E, like Menti B, Locky D, and so on. Mm. So it's interesting. It's a it's a an interesting choice in a number of ways. And I would expect nothing less from that particular team. Okay. I the mm-hmm. comment section is popping off, by the way, and I agree with Ferrocat. How else do you refer to a really well-made cake? You know, that's just mm-hmm. that's just my that's that's my thing. Yep. Magistra Annie asks, what's the Bob in Cory Bobs, and I can't figure that one out. I mean, coronation, it sounds like you you shortened it out to coronation, but you're not Australian, so you can't just stop with Cory. You've got to add something to complete the template. And so it sounds from this like Bob is just some sort of placeholder, just some sort of filler or some kind of like default ending. But I have Anika says Jendi Bobs. It's it's like a, it's like the end of a like a gene pool like spin off thing like like it feels like the the productive usage is now just like dissolving into its constituent genetic parts. It feels it. Let's finish this part up with uh, Oxford languages who came out with theirs not too long ago, and the word was riz. Oh, they went really young. Yeah, they did actually. They were. <laughs> That's I like I like that. I just have this picture of like a bunch of really doddery, older Oxford type, which I know they're probably not, but that's like the (laughs) brand of Oxford, right? Is this like, we are the last word on words. It is part of their appeal. And they've gone with like, riz. Yep. And remember, this is not the Oxford English Dictionary. This is Oxford Languages, which is sort of like uh, an organization that does stuff with words, but it's kind of like a feeder. It feels to me like it's a feeder for Oxford. So if it does well with Oxford languages, then it goes on. Oh. But they they chose that. I thought it was interesting because Riz was actually big on the list for the American Dialect Society back in 2022. So this oh, is okay. this is not a new one, but it seems like one that Oxford is just sort of catching up on. Alrighty. Are we done with the with the with the notables with the like the the whistle stop tour of dictionaries and dictionary like entities? We're done with that for the English language, but now we have to talk about languages other than English. Many of them suggested by Diego. Hey, Diego, do you want to patch in? <laughs> You're welcome to come and uh, tell us about these. I'll I'll 
Pinya. You want to come in? Yeah, sure. Awesome. There we go. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being such a great contributor over the year and over the years. Diego is always flooding us with uh, in our Discord with lots of show ideas, lots of uh, lots of news items. It's it's so great to have you. Thank you for all you do. It really does help the show. It means a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> so where do you want to start? I've got a bunch here. Um, do you want to start with German? Uh, which which German? Swiss German or Germany uh, German? <laughs> I Deutsch. <laughs> I was thinking of not Swiss German at first. I thought we'd take the okay. four Swiss languages all at once. Uh, I've got Krisen Modus. Right. Uh, crisis mode, I believe. Oh, that's ah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let me just find it. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons to be, well, you know, a little bit concerned about the disruption that happens all around us. And... I have young ones who are starting to realize that they're going to die. I've got young daughters who are at that age where they're starting to recognize, oh, I am mortal. And we do a lot of talking with my five-year-old and my seven-year-old about how change. Change is always around us. But it feels like the pace of change is really, really huge. Things are popping up. Things are existing that just simply didn't exist. You know, Chad GPT again but also chaos in the world around us. So crisis mode, it's it's fair, right? It's a yeah, fair I feel pick. like that one doesn't require a whole lot of explanation. I feel people can be like, oh, crisis mode was Germany's word of the year, and we'd all be like, yeah, that yeah, tracks. Fair, fair. Let's see, what else you got? Uh, what, what's the next one you want to tackle? Yeah, uh, one that I just found uh, yesterday is actually the uh, the Basque word of the year, or uh, Euskada. Mm. Yeah, hit us. Um, yeah, so the word in Basque, I think I'm saying it correctly, is zerenda, um, zerenda. which uh, which means strip, as in uh, the Gaza Strip. So uh, oh. the, the full phrase in, in Basque would be Gazako zeren Zerenda. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess they've chosen it as the, the word of the year, um, mainly because of how often uh, the Gaza Strip has, has come up in the news uh, recently, but apparently also because... The word itself in Basque, uh, serenda, has uh, multiple meanings, um, including list, like a list of things, um, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a ribbon, or a or a band, similar to a strip. So uh, it's kind of twofold: um, the the political, you know, usage of the word, but also kind of to remind uh, Basque speakers that uh, the word serenda also has this meaning in this context of, uh, of Gaza Strip. So, yeah, it's a little uh, unusual compared to the other ones that have come up this year. Yeah, okay. Let's go over to Japan where we've got two, one that's uh, spoken and then kanji of the year. Yes, um, I think somebody else found the the kanji of the year, but I had seen uh, in a Spanish <laughs> article, funny enough. That's right. The, you, yeah, you linked that to me and I was, that was a funny experience because I was reading it and I'm like, I'm reading Spanish. This is weird. What's going on? <laughs> James has also in chat pointed us to the the kanji of the year. So, yeah, there's a, there's a decent uh, Japanese population in uh, Peru and Argentina and other uh, and Brazil, other South American countries. Um, so I'm not sure if that's the connection, but <laughs> um, so the word is are. I believe, uh, which means that or that over there. Mm -hmm. um, the publishing house Jiu Kokomincha chose this word because there's a winning baseball team of plucky underdogs, the people who haven't won a, the, the, the pennant. It's not a pennant, is it? They won the championship uh, for the first time since the 80s. And they used it as an acronym of English words, right. interestingly, aim, respect, empower. Noble words. But they ah, oh, but it, they but, but it's a it's a true acronym in the sense that it it makes a word when said out loud kind of thing. That's it. That's it. So that's the word of the year in Japan. Are meaning that. And are it, like when we say that in English, my understanding, my extremely limited understanding, is that it's one of those words that are like any given language has that is like super versatile. I believe. Like you can be Japanese and be like, are, 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 and it can mean a lot of different things given oh. the actual context that's happening. Like it might mean uh, any Japanese speakers in the, in the, in the chat, please weigh in on this. But my understanding is like, it's like, like the word, Hey, 
can mean so much stuff oh, right, in English okay. depending on how you're using it kind of thing. Does Japanese have a two-way split like here and there, or does it have a three-way split like here, there, and way over there? Could somebody in chat let me know? I, I think, yeah. I speak Japanese to, to a degree. So they have a three-way um, distinction, uh, near me, next to you, or uh, neither. So <laughs> they have uh, kore, are, and sore. Kore is near me, sore is near you, and mm -hmm. are is neither. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Nathaniel. That's great. I'm Cheers. trying to trying to produce at the same time as driving. It's really weird. And then the kanji of the year. Yeah. If Diego don't mind, the kanji of the year is zai, uh, is taxes. Taxes. As in like to yeah, like to pay taxes, taxes to the in, government. Yeah, the money you have to pay to the government. Yeah. Why did that um, seem to be so notable this year as opposed to? Yes, they, they, they have some um, tax reform, I think. Uh, on Wikipedia, they said they have um, tax cuts and they have introduced a new invoicing system. So they have reforms on taxes. So die taxes for the country of the year. There you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Jeez. Okay. Thank you, Nathaniel. Let's... That was very informative. I think it's time to go to Switzerland. Rebecca via email also mentioned these, so I wanted to give her a shout out as well. As we know, Switzerland has four official languages, Italian, German, French, and Romance. So let's see. I can see here that the in, in the article you linked to, Diego, Italian, the word is GPT, which stands for, <laughs> I always forget. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> generated personal text, generated... Pa, 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 pa. Okay. Oh, James has got it. Generative pre-trained transformers. Ah, pre-trained transformers. Of course. Not robots in disguise. So it <laughs> generates it generates text. It's pre-trained. So they just they just run a computer over the patterns and then you've sort of got your weights and then you can use those weights. And the transformers refers to the way that you insert text at one level and it just sort of gets handed up through layers and layers of neurons and at every stage it transforms the text aaron says is it not exactly robots in disguise daniel you know what I, <laughs> yeah, I might have to... that's a good point that's a really really good point aaron mm, yeah i can't say no on that one <laughs> all right well uh german somebody take it diego save me <laughs> Yes. Uh, so in the Swiss German word of the of the year was monster bank. Um, just I guess uh, there was a, a some sort of banking notable, crisis, or actually there was a notable um, a bank merger uh, that happened. I guess because people were, or sorry, after the merger, people were starting to worry about uh, what you know this giant super bank. You know what kind of consequences it could have, L like a concentration of financial blah blah blah. Not just any bank, it was Credit right. Suisse. Oh my gosh. And UBS. But who did they merge with? Some <laughs> some slightly smaller not. UBS. Okay. UBS and yeah. Credit Suisse. So it made Swiss people worry about the creation of a monster bank, which I think should just be the official name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone in the branding department is like, oof. Oh, that's no, a tough sell. <laughs> you give it a cute cartoon mascot. You're done. That's I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> It's not how it works, but it could be. Mind you, BP did it with a green flower. So, like, who who's the real fucking idiot? Me. That's it. <laughs> yeah, so you just don't know when you see it, but it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a good time to remember, as Magistra Annie reminds us, that <laughs> chat GPT in French means cat. I farted. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on yeah. to French while we're talking just, about French. I just had this image of someone alone in their apartment, just very seriously being like, cat, cat, I fatigue. Cat, it, uh, this, this happened. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait? <laughs> Take me to French. The word was déco décombre. And this is right. not a word in my vocabulary. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, it means rubble or uh, or debris. Um, oh yeah, I can see why this guess... might. Yeah. Well, it would seem to mostly highlight uh, the natural disasters that have happened this year, mainly the the earthquakes in in Syria and uh, in Turkey. Um, so I guess uh, you know just the 
aiming to highlight, you know, uh, the climate crisis, uh, global geopolitical issues. Um, and uh, apparently they're also using it to refer to the collapse of the the uh, Swiss or what is it, uh, Credit Swiss. Mm-hmm. I would have thought this would have been also tied into the political unrest that has sort of plagued Paris this year as well. Well, well we're talking the, about the Swiss, Swiss French. French. Oh, okay. I don't know Sorry. how much they care about what's going on over there. <laughs> My bad. My bad. I thought we were just doing French French. They're neutral. They're neutral. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know what, guys? I'm seeing, folks, I'm seeing a couple of clear themes emerging from our word of the year so far. It's pessimism <laughs> pessimism <laughs> <Yeah>, cynicism <laughs> and computers i guess maybe one maybe maybe one theme and then in romanche the word was solar express which is a program that they're doing to promote uh the installation of solar panels on alpine peaks which is a very yes. nice use of an alpine peak all right let's see uh i'm going to throw it open if you oh dita you were telling us that you were uh, covering the Danish scene. Do you want to? You want to just if you want to. If you don't want to, that's totally cool. But you want to jump in? Yes. Jump All right. In. Tell me what you um, got. Well, uh, the actual word we chose is pretty boring because we chose Chat GPT, so that's <laughs> the same, almost the same as a lot of other stuff. Classic. Mm-hmm. They had they had some other some other of the runners up. up up that were AI related too, and they ended up choosing that because they said they liked it was something concrete. I would, I would have thought it made more sense with the more generic, but that was their feeling. But I was kind of looking. I listened to the radio show where they they decided, and I was looking at the, all the the nominated words and did and noticing a few themes. There mm-hmm. was the AI. And then there was a little bit about gender equality and gender-related language. One of the words was was Barbie just because of the movie, but the other was for person, which means chairperson as opposed to chairman or chairwoman. Wow. Because there has been a lot of discussion and people are paying more attention to, to that gendered language. Mm-hmm. And there was there was some climate related words, not Surprisingly, I suppose. And then a few very sort of specific words to stuff that happened in Denmark, like people's property valuations being all wrong and uh, and a holiday that has got that got cancelled, so we won't have that holiday anymore. <laughs> oh, and actually Riz got an honorable mention because <laughs> someone had, had had nominated it back when like the general public public could nominate and they were doing the la- the show in front of a live audience at a high school and <laughs> uh, the, the the guy who oh. who runs the radio program that chose the that chose the word he's like 60 60 early 60 something and he was like i don't know this word and then asked all the young people and people if they liked it and it was just like a huge cheer so generational <laughs> and divide clearly you know, this is the thing about words of the year. We're we're reaching for a statement of our age and how we're feeling. And we usually do such a, a good job on that, but we're also just having a lot of fun with it. I, as far as Riz goes, I forgot to mention this, but as you might know, I do a weekly gig on the Australian ABC radio Perth. I begged the audience, largely older folks, maybe 50 or 60 plus, I begged them to start using Riz in conversations with young people please just start using it it's like hmm, oh, daniel that, that outfit's a bit drippy on you but that one gives you mad riz no daniel oh daniel <laughs> oh you are a monster you are See, a bad man and you need to be stopped are you saying that i'm going to kill riz single-handedly you it will- absolutely will <laughs> at least in in a in a in a in a micro sense like here in perth riz will go the way of facebook and instagram because that's where all of the boomers are hanging out and the the youth will be like Ugh. we've talked about boomers yeah i mean you know I, I notice how ben is cringing and he's not even young he's only you know youth adjacent i'm yeah, at best at <laughs> best youth adjacent 
<laughs> okay. Well, hey, thank you for those. Um, I, I'm going to uh, move it along and unpin some people. Diego, uh, thanks for heading up this section. I really appreciate you and and all the others of us who are uh, who are contributing to these words. Good. All right. We're going to get into our words, but before we do, it's time for... Kara says, I'm 18, and I could tell you that's the wrong way to use Riz, but we appreciate your effort. Yes, I want to use Riz in slightly in slightly the wrong, like slightly, yeah, but oh, yeah, obviously good. wrong ways. Did, yes, nice defense, <laughs> Daniel. Classic. It's, oh, no, 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 no. What no, I, I was I doing to, was- I meant it to was, do that. It was, no, it was deliberate, eh? Like, nah. You're, our friendship has never been this endangered. <laughs> Okay, it's time for our favorite game with our favorite people. Lanika, are you here? We used one from you. Yes, I'm here. Hey, go ahead. And do you mind if I pin you? Sure. sure. Hey, are All you right. talking about picket fence? And I am. Tell fine. us what you got. What'd you find? What, 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 um, hit us with the question and tell me what made you think of this. Um, so the question is, is the picket and picket fence related to the picket and picket line? Um, the reason it came up was because I, um, was, I interacted with a picket line and was, um, thinking, you know, you don't cross a picket line and you don't cross a picket fence and wondering if that's related in any way. All right. Okay. Well, okay. Related so, or not. Here we go. 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 I'm going to say, I'm going to put up a poll pretty soon. So, you know, maybe okay. we'll sway you, maybe not. Uh, I think that yes. And I think that the unifying sense is that you pull up sticks from the fence and you use them to make signs. I was ah. going to say the same thing. That, that literally exactly what my thought was, which was you like, you've got that classic thing of like a person with the with the stake over their shoulder with a big placard like roughly nailed to it being like you save our jobs or whatever it is uh, mm -hmm. something usually very good and like give us enough money to live and to feed our families or other like completely unreasonable requests on the part of mm -hmm. workers mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm i that's what i would have thought as well but maybe i should just be a contrarian and be like no it's I different you should, you should listen to your heart okay then yes i think it is the same Okay, Lanika, I presume that you know the answer, but before you tell us the answer, did you have a, an intuition going in? I do not know the answer. I was hoping you would do the research for me. <laughs> <laughs> I often have these questions and I'm like, I know how to find that out. Well, why don't we get the audience to do their thing? We, You can say related, no, yeah, or you can say it's unrelated, yeah, no. We've got a lot of people saying that this is related. I'm liking Aaron's comment in the chat, which is I'm rooting for them to not be related because then I want to know how on earth they ended up converging. And I actually agree with that. I 100% hmm. now I want them not to be related. I'm like, how could they possibly have come together? Well, let's show those results. There we go. So Ooh. it looks like a whole ton of people said, yep, totally related. Only a couple of people said, I'm going to get this if everyone else is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the and correct answer is they are totally related. Uh, for the reason we thought? No. Oh, okay. This is fun. Picket is related to pike. And you know that a pike is a big old stick. Well, a fancy spear, really. A spear with airs, I think we could call a pike. Right. Or you could use it to not just defend yourself, but you could stick it into the ground to make a fence. And that's why you have a picket fence. Okay. And I thought, hmm, pike, picket. Is this another example of diminutive et, like puppet, or like a casket is a small cask, or a packet is a small pack? A strumpet sure. is a small strump. No? And then, by 1761... <laughs> It meant a bunch of soldiers acting as a fence. They would look out for the enemy. Oh, to, you know, yes, of course. To, make it hard to cross. And then by 1867, it meant a bunch of workers, like soldiers, stations outside a factory. There you go. So, you yes, go. Um, that that is actually, um, like, I, I hope, Aaron, you found that as satisfying as I did. Because, yeah, like, like, how did that? Mm. That's fun. Yeah. Um, and by the way, uh, what do you do when your nose goes on strike? Pick it. Uh, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, Lanika, thank you so much for that one. You're a bad man. 
This is this is the second time in this episode that I've just had in no uncertain terms the absolute certainty that you are a bad person. I know, but you keep dealing with me. I'm a bad person you can't stop loving. Yeah, you're my heroine. You're my black tar heroine, Daniel. That's what's going on here. Enough about that. Let's go on to Kara. Kara, are you in the audience? Because I picked one from you, which I liked. Kara's not here. Hey, you are. Yeah, it's like six, so I'm still in bed, actually, on my computer. (laughs) That's fine. You keep your video off. We love hearing your voice. What a horrendous way to start your day. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Are you on the worst coast? I am on the worst coast. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hopefully Do you I'm remember what it was? To a better time zone. Oh, I submitted like a bunch of different ones. I don't know which one you guys chose. I chose cyan. Oh, cyan mm. and cyanide. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. First, first thought. Uh, my initial gut reaction is yes, just because it's such a bizarre collection of letters in english right yeah. c-y-a-n there's just it's not a thing that will just randomly jumble together very often so based on that but is but. there something to do with welsh in here because if i know one thing about welsh it's that it does fucking whack <laughs> stuff with letters <laughs> <laughs> oh. welsh folks i hope you're okay with that you know it's oh, true. I say that with love, right? Like, <laughs> like I say that with like, good on you, Welsh, for just taking the lettering system and just going to town and just okay. having a great old time. I don't know enough myself to say that they're chemically different. I know nothing about their chemistry. I'm going to say that they are related, and I think maybe it has something to do with the color that cyanide is somehow blue or something. Oh. Cara, do you do you know the answer? Um. I might have at one point. I think I've forgotten. I do remember. <laughs> I, I forget um, these two. That I looked it up. I looked okay. it up. Um, that means you get to guess anew. You get to guess all fresh. <laughs> what do you think? Because I because we were talking about um, cyanide poisoning in my AP bio class. Mm. Um, you something you to do, do with like <laughs> electron chain transport or whatever. Wow. Um, well, I tell you what, shall I launch this one and we'll have people uh, give it a try? Here ooh, we go. Yeah, this is ooh, fun. yeah. I get to guess in here. We've got, we've got a clear, we, ha- we have a clear <laughs> leader again. We must be very a convincing. A lot of yeses. Mm. Yeah, but I like oh. us being wrong. I love us being wrong. It's not so lopsided this time. All right. 25 of us have guessed. I'm going to... Close it off and share the results. Oh, hey, sorry about that last person. I almost almost cut you off there. Okay. So it looks like most of us think that this one is related to, and the correct answer, yep, totally related. Cyan comes from Greek kyanos. There's that cut to sir thing like cycle and kiklos. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, kyanos, dark blue or dark blue enamel, and cyanide is from the same thing. Because what happens is you take Prussian blue, which is a kind of blue pigment, chemical name, potassium ferric hexacyanoferrate, has cyan in it. Wow. <laughs> they had so many to choose from. Uh-huh. And then you, heat- <laughs> then you heat it up and you get prussic acid. Uh, who pointed out, was it, oh, I forget who pointed out that it was Blaus, somebody who speaks German, help me out. Um, well, if you were looking for whoever pointed it out on the Discord, that was me and in Danish, not German, but we have the same. We call it ah. Blausjuga, but it is in, in German too. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, that's that's the name there. So you heat it up, you get prussic acid, and it comes from that blue dye. So they are totally related. Can we just stop for a second, though? And mm-hmm. acknowledge that cyan, as we use it, does not look particularly blue. It's not like, Prussian blue, not like, at all. At all, like no. cyan is the lightest of blues with a bunch of green, mi- like looking like it's mixed in as well. Um, like like the printing color, like cyan, magenta, yellow kind of thing. It's like a really not at all dark blue, like at all. No, it's cyan. 
<laughs> what? That's yes, you what say that, is. but you literally just went, ah, oh, cyan, the deep Prussian blue. So, you know, forgive me for being a bit confused, Daniel. All right, all right. I'll give you this one. Let's do our last one. So in Discord, I mentioned that uh, I'm reading a book with my kids about Lapland. And I thought, Lap, what's up with that? Ooh. And then I learned to my dismay. Yeah, that no, Lap, we don't. We it's don't say not that. a nice term. No, mm-hmm. it's an insulting exonym. And instead, we like, oh, no, I was going to write down what the, the correct term is, the endonym. Is it, is it, is it not Sami? Sa- Sabmi? Sapmi. I've seen Sabmi and I've seen Sapmi. So that was a disappointing thing. I'm I'm going to change my mental lexicon that way. But I thought, hmm, lap. Somebody can sit on your lap. A cat can lap up milk when it drinks. And once around the track or once around the pool is a lap. Are Ooh, okay. any of these related? We got a three-way split here. I chose the, the hardest one for last. Okay. So, are we are we going all three? Let me put up the poll, and here will be your choices. So the way I've decided to do this is they're all related, okay, or none of them are related. But then we've got sitting on your lap, drinking up, lapping up liquid, or running around the track. So they're sitting, drinking, and running. Do you think that sitting and drinking those two meanings of lap are related, or <laughs> sitting and the running a lap are they related? Or the drinking and running are related. So I've, I've done a pairwise thing there, if you can get your mind around that. Or they're all related, or they're not related. My guess is I think that they are none of them related. I, don't, I think that oh. it's just so short a word and such common sounds they could have converged. Okay, I'm going to, just just to be a bit different, I'm going to guess that some there's some relation going on there. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with only two people, and I'm going to say they're all related. I'm going to go the unsafe route. Okay. Well, I'm going to cut off the poll here pretty soon. Twenty-seven of us. This is a hotly contested. Here we go. I'm going to share these results. There we go. Screenshot for the video. All right. Most people said either only the drinking sense of lap and the running sense of lap are related, or what I chose, which was none of them are related. What did you think? That- I said all of them are related because oh, I live oh. on the edge, Daniel. Okay. The correct answer. Here we go. Two of them are related. Ooh, okay. Okay, wait. Hang on, though. <laughs> now we get to have the fun thing of being like, oh, which two? All right. Two of them are related. Okay, so 10 people in the chat thought drinking and running were the two related ones, like doing a lap of a track. You do a lap. Or a, or a pool. And you or, drink a um, you lap yeah, it up. Or you, Okay. Okay. Um, I think sitting and drinking are going to be the related two. Ah, oh, minority of view. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm rolling big again. If you said that the sitting and the running are related, then you are correct. Oh, that was another minority opinion. Kind of. Yeah. Only 14%. Sitting and running. How is that? How? So, so. the thing, the thing that, is like where crumbs fall <laughs> and, <laughs> and going around a motorized raceway are related. Please tell me how, Daniel. Well, it's funny that you should mention, you know, crumbs falling because the really old meaning of lap was it was a, a flap. A lap was a flap of clothing or fabric that hung down off of your shirt and you would use it to maybe catch crumbs or more like flowers. We usually see they carried flowers in their lap. Oh, which, I w- which meant so, so like a bit more of a big pocket that like housewives would wear that you could put like your berries and your eggs and stuff in. Yeah, you could put stuff in there, right? Okay, okay. And then the meaning pretty quickly jumped to the place on your lap where you kept that flappy bit of your shirt. Okay, okay. so it's essentially it was like a marsupial pouch <laughs> that we then just like used for our lap. Exactly. Okay. okay. Now and take me then, to raceways. Okay. When you fold a cloth over like that mm-hmm. it fo- in your lap, it forms a kind of loop, like the loop on a track. It comes back to the beginning. And wow. they, both, they both come from Old English, lapa. The unrelated sense to lap up liquid comes from a different Old English word, lapian, to lap up or drink. And this could actually be imitative, echoic. An onomatopoeia. Precisely. Okay. There you so, go. 
There we go. So um, that was a fun sort of related or not. I hope you enjoy these. And we do appreciate the way that people are bringing these. We will endeavor to keep doing as many of these as as you've got time to give us. A uh, little on on lapping things up, a um and the imitative sound. I we have my household has a new cat. We had an old cat as and we still have the old cat. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want this to be like a sad story. And then oh. we got a, a kitten. We've got a new cat. Um, yep. and I did not realize that my first cat drank very quietly. <laughs> <laughs> because my new cat doesn't. She just makes so much noise. Did you like say, just, what the hell is that sound? Yeah, I literally just woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, is, is a ghost choking in my home? What is happening? It's a That's very hilarious. small creature, but it makes a surprising amount of noise drinking liquid. Anyway. Ben, we've got a request from Paracat to meet the new cat. Do you think that I, it's possible? I held it. I held it before, but what oh. I will do, because she's a little bit of a fraidy cat, is I'll uh. I'll upload some very heartwarming pictures. Okay. That would be nice. We have a lot of requests to meet the cat. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll bring her okay. back. Maybe at the end if she's if I can find her. But now it's time for the Because Language words of the week of the year. We did 52 of them, and that's not one per week. Sometimes we have three or four or none. It just so magically happened to make it seem like we do a Amazing. show a week. Amazing. <laughs> and I gathered them up, threw them onto Facebook, Twitter, Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Discord, and people could vote on them for comments, as many of you did. Thank you for participating. It was a lot of fun. Before we get to the top 10, I thought it would be fun to look at weird little things, the words that were weirdly specific to one platform. Okay. Because sometimes one platform for a certain word, like 50% of that word's votes would come from like just Twitter or just right. Mastodon. So, so there was just like a, like a big thing there. And I wondered if it said anything about the folks who use it. So Facebook loved hard launch. And that is when, you, when a famous person busts out a new uh, significant other uh, with no sort of warning. Facebook like that one. Also, engagement farming, which is when you just keep cranking out posts that maybe don't have much value, but it keeps oh, people yeah. engaged. Yeah. Twitter, uh, five out of the 10 votes for whom of which came. An unusual formation like our striker, whom of which is one of our best players, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's okay. Fair enough. All right. Blue Sky was interesting. Blue Sky liked Tober, which is getting inspiration for things during the month of October. Blue Sky liked mummy. We're pivoting away from mummy and referring to mummified people as a way of showing that they are people just like us. Um, I had this experience. There was an Egyptian exhibit at the Boulevardip in Perth, the museum. And I took both of my girls to it. And I said, they said, what, what are all these things? I said, well, this is all these drawings and all these things that they made were ways that they showed the people that they loved them and missed them. And they wanted them to be happy in the afterlife. And that was what they did. Man, you guys, you guys circle death a lot in your family. It is not my choice. <laughs> I just want to talk about Bluey and find Long Dog in every episode, okay? I don't go there of my own choice. And then Blue Sky also liked Skeet, which is a tweet, the Sky tweet, that you a post that you make on Blue Sky. Mastodon really liked Noctalgia which is sky grief or the sadness that we're getting so much light pollution, it's hard to do terrestrial-based oh. astronomy. Okay. And Discord, hi, everybody. Discord loved <laughs> spicy and girl. Spicy girl? Hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the top 10. Are you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm primed. I'm pumped. I'm okay. tantalized. You know, you're coming up with a lot of ways to say enthused. Maybe you should use that as like a connections category. Oh, that's fine. I've been doing that a little bit recently. Uh, Aisha <laughs> is so much smarter than I am. It, mm. it is yet another game where I realize my partner is much cleverer than I am. Or just patched into American culture. Mm, possibly. I, mm. I, will always, I will always have framed, though. At least I can say that. Yeah, you will. There was a three-way tie for 10th place. Number 10, Angertainment. Angertainment. These are news stories intended to get engagement by fomenting a sense of outrage in the audience, and it's an example of the combining form, tainment. Fun. Certainly not new, but the word is new, so that's good. Mm, it's, it's popping up a lot because people are becoming aware of the attention economy and how 
if you can mm-hmm. be horrible, then you can get eyeballs, and that's just as good as saying something good or something. But like the I, famous line from the um, who's the famous shock jock in America, Howard Stern. Um, yeah, people who love him listen for forty minutes. People who hate him listen for an hour and a half. Kind <laughs> of. Thing. That's a good. I used it with an ABC producer who wanted me to come on because I'm always fielding calls from all over the country and they say, hey, this thing happened. Do you want to do a 15 minute thing at 3.30? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you, um, you, they, they have your number. They do You're have the my word number guy. and they use it. Yeah. So here was the message. Hey, would you be open to a chat about millennial words people hate this Arvo? Right. Millennial words that people hate. I, th- I, th- I had thought that we had moved completely past I thought millennials were understood to be boomer adjacent now. Like we were the sad, old, crotchety people as well. Apparently, some people just didn't get the memo. So okay. my first response was tart, and then I erased it. <laughs> I thought you were just calling them tarts. No, <laughs> tart. No, I, I frequently <laughs> do reply that way, but not this time. Okay. And I said, could I interest you in a better idea for a show? The reason is that this topic is not the kind of show that's in the public interest. All it does is lead to a peeve fest. Angertainment feels good, but it's not good for us. Look at you slowly making the ABC be a bit better. Well done, Daniel. You're the Toby (sighs) Ziegler of the Australian radio production zone. Who? I wasn't done. Uh, uh, I said... It's also problematic because the words singled out for hatred are often the ones used by disesteemed or marginalized communities. I'd really encourage you not to do this kind of show, but I can help you find a better topic. So that was me. Bravo, sir. And I which, also- did, Let me guess, to which they were like, can you just shut up and do the thing we want? They said, they said yeah, what do, you, what do you got? And I gave them a few ideas and they said, oh, we've, we've got somebody else, <laughs> which happens all the time. <laughs> Yeah. And they haven't they haven't called back. Oh well. Oh uh, yeah. Mm, they will. They will. Because who else? <laughs> They'll get desperate yeah, enough. That's right. The that's other right. word people won't be available. But I've been thinking about this essay by C. T. Nguyen called Hostile Epistemology. I've been I've been really thinking about it a lot. They point out that um when someone is like a QAnon person or they have conspiracy theories or bad like they're like anti whatever, um we think of them as, well, these are people who are kind of bad. And they point out that bad information uses exploits in our brain, psychological exploits that take advantage of our cognitive limitations. And one of those things is that we like stuff that feels good and angertainment feels good. But just like with like the salty or fatty or sugary foods that I love to eat, you know, it feels good to my body. But I don't always ask myself, is this the kind of good feeling? that is really good for me? Or is this a kind of feeling good that's not that great for me? And angertainment, I think, is like that. It's fun. It's, it's really fun. It's junk food, for sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 100%. It is. So I'm trying. Let's see. Also at number 10, the tism suggested by Pharaoh Cat. Pharaoh Cat, I, if you want to stick your voice out there and tell us about this one, that's cool. Otherwise, I can read what I got. What do you, what do you reckon? Are you, do you want to? Pharaoh Cat might be a way... From the no, computer. no, no, she's there. She's, you, kitty. There we go. Oh, I'm yes. unmuted now. Hey, tell us about what led you to, to think of this one. Sorry, slowly dying of plague. Oh, I'm sorry. Get better, okay? Yep, yep. Sorry, I finally caught COVID. It just took four years. Oh, no. Yeah. You're no more Team Novid. I'm so sorry. <sighs> sorry, pal. Um, it sucks. Yeah. Brendan's still sudden, somehow immune, but whatever. Um, mm-hmm. okay. I just like Brendan smugly waving from his isolation chamber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have been isolating from each other. It's ridiculous. Yeah, good on you. Um, okay, the tism. Um, this is something that I've seen a lot on Tumblr, so I don't know if it's just a Tumblr thing or if it's spread out to the wider world. Definitely spread. Oh. Um, but a friend of mine actually posted a, a picture and said... I've made a room just for the tism and it was like a, a sensory room with fidgets and squishy things and weighted blankets and stuff like that. Finally makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's a fun way of saying autism, saying I have the tism. Yep. A touch of the tism. Um, I, I thought it was fun. Yeah. 
and it and it's this would be appropriate within the autism community if i can use that term would that be right it might be weird if i said it as an allistic person yeah it's it's pretty much just the autistic community at the moment um i'm not saying it's not going to spread to wider use but right now it's just an us word okay it's an us word i like that awesome thank you well that's number 10 so c- thank you for bringing that up to us what's the third number 10 daniel gone past tense a metaphor for when an entity dies and the verbs on its Wikipedia page must now be tense shifted. You could even <laughs> say, oh, good. Henry Kissinger has just gone past tense. Look, I don't want to take it away from gone past tense. But um, yeah, like that, that guy was a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was a really bad human being. Wow. Yeah, just, I'm just only a, beginning just a, to plumb the extent of it. True, like historical leaderboard piece of shit kind of thing like this person like I, I i'm not entirely sure how like sports work but i believe in like english football circles the premier league is in fact just the the the, the best of the best of lots of different teams across like britain and i feel like kissinger made it into the premier league hmm. of shit fuckery on like a historical scale so he gets to rub shoulders with like Genghis Khan, and Hitler, and, and Stalin, and yep. and some of these like absolute monsters. So Wikipedia user A Sticky has, I think, tweeted or something. I'm now forever the girl who changed is to was on Henry Kissinger's Wikipedia article. Nice. <laughs> that's that's nerdy, but I respect it. Let's go on to number nine, Noctalgia. Oh, we, one, yeah, we mentioned this just before, didn't we? Just a little while ago. Diego suggested this one. Thank you, Diego. Literally, uh, I got it wrong. I said sky grief. It's actually more like night grief. Yes. Nocturne. Yes. Sadness of the loss of dark skies on the part of Earth-based astronomers as the prevalence of light pollution increases. Now, I believe when we talked about this last time, not not 30 seconds ago, but like when we mentioned it in a show a while ago, mm. I recounted to um, our listeners and to you guys that like you in, in parts of Australia, certainly that I've been to that are quite remote. Um, and, and some people might not appreciate this who like live in Europe or in parts of America with like bad light pollution is on a moonless night when the Milky Way is is up, is is like in the sky, it can be bright enough to cast shadows on the ground. Like I've, mm. I've, I've experienced that myself. Yeah. And um, so, yes, I can absolutely understand the grief that can come with losing that ability to sort of almost feel like you can reach out and touch the cosmos. It's really, 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 it's one of those things like I imagine what like a full uh, solar eclipse would be like. I remember just being like, oh, I'm so insignificant Mm. in a good way, in a cool way. Mm. Let's go to number eight. Another one suggested by Diego. This one was algo speak code words or expressions used to avoid content moderation. So saying I've got corn instead of porn on a live. That's a classic one. Can we, Diego, do you want to patch in? Have you noticed any others that are interesting or Ben? Um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily the same thing. Uh, I'll put an example in the chat, but I've seen things like for celebrity names, like they'll do dots in between, like, Ah. so that if somebody's searching their name, like, you know, to take content down or whatever, that's not a a authorized or approved, they'll put like little symbols in between the actual name or word and i guess Mm. people know to search for it like the people who want to look for it can find it Mm -hmm. that way but the people who are trying to get stuff down they miss it so that's the only other uh example that i've seen which is very similar to voldemorting that's another example of uh, Mm -hmm. that's a subgroup Mm -hmm. of algo speak i remember um accountant was a stand-in for um stripping strippers or Mm. uh, erotic dancers um so if you were on if you were scrolling through TikTok, I saw a couple of people in the in the in the windows just being like, "Huh?" Eh? If you were scrolling through TikTok, um, you you I I don't know what this reflects about me, but like I, I would hope that this is not because I'm following a lot of strippers per se, but because like people who speak very positively, sex positively about certain types of work were like trying to educate and and share tips and that sort of thing. Um, and so to avoid being um like 
crunched down into obscurity, you would refer to yourself as an accountant. The, I guess, most boring of all professions is how they settled on that thing, but I feel that's a bit mean to accountants, maybe. <laughs> Magistra Annie has pointed out that it's euphemism, euphemism for sex work, not just stripping. Oh, also, okay. Thank uh, you. Aria Flame and Aaron have mentioned seamstress in this context, so that's useful. Oh, okay. There we okay. Go. Thank you, Diego, for that one again. You don't mind me just, just bringing you on, do you? <laughs> just just, just uh, producing. Spotlight. Okay, there's a three-way tie for fifth. Jill suggested this one, rainbow capitalism, which I defined as ostentatious, vacuous, and insincere corporate support for LGTBQ plus causes sometimes hastily withdrawn in the face of conservative outrage as happened with Target in the USA. See also rainbow washing, rainbow capitalism. I think there was an example of a beer company in the States. This happened to as well. But um, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Although didn't they stick by it? Did Bud Light cave or did they, I, to my knowledge, people are still complaining about it, but oh, who okay. knows? I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay. Enough said on that one. Uh, also fifth place suggested by Pharaoh Cat and Aria Flame, the glass cliff. Do you remember this one? It has to be related to glass ceiling. It is. I am imagining. Oh, you weren't on this one, so this one's new to you. That's okay. Right. It was. Let me, just let me see if I can. Let me see if I can puzzle this one out. Hmm. So glass ceiling. So cliffs are bad. So it's something bad that women in position, like like impl are being like promoted to, and then badness. That's mm -hmm. that's as far as I've gotten. Mm. Okay. You are correct on the badness. So okay. um, here's my definition. Women are pushed to the glass cliff when they are promoted to positions of corporate responsibility at times when things aren't going well and the risk of failure is highest. <laughs> okay. Here, you hold these incriminating documents for a moment. <laughs> I'm going to be over here. Why don't you be CEO for a while? Good luck. I'm, I'll be in Key West. Bye. Lord Mortis uh, says in chat, the former Optus CEO just got pushed off of her one. And Linda Yaccarino is also on a glass cliff at X. Oh, yeah, Good examples. man. Tough, yeah. tough. Hmm. Uh, okay. And then the other fifth place was suggested by Diego. Beige flag. Uh, <laughs> I, yes, I've, I've had thoughts on beige flag this year because I felt I, I, I felt it shift and I didn't like how it shifted. What's the shift? Well, it originally started out as essentially like um, warning signs for being boring and bad, right? Like, that was the original like semantic meaning of a beige flag, which is like, oh, I went on a date and uh, this guy was giving off all sorts of beige flags. Like he had a strong opinion about whether pineapples belonged on pizza. And it was just like things that people can do that just prove like, oh, okay, you're okay, right. Having, like having not, a favorite not, not font. Not terrible. Yeah, exactly. Not <laughs> not awful. Those would be red flags, right? No, those, but beige yeah, flags would be fine. like, oh, okay, the, all right, mate. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, you're a bit chuggy, aren't you? Oh, Daniel. <laughs> let okay. It go, let it go, um, Daniel. But um, so, so, so what's but the new shifted, meaning? Yeah. It shifted to be like pet peeves that predominantly girlfriends say about guys i think that's that's what i was picking up it's like my boyfriend's beige flag is that he waits too long to put on the windscreen wipers when we're driving and it starts to rain and like weird sort of like shit like that like it was it was but it was said lovingly like it was like ah oh, isn't it cute how but i was like no no, beige flags are important. We need to know when people are boring and uninteresting and you need to get out of the conversation. Don't, don't take the beige flags away. I, I don't think you can take away the beige flags. I think that stuff's pretty obvious. You feel bored. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Okay. So, yes, originally a personality attribute or interest so boring that it might make a potential partner unsuitable. More recently, an endearing quirk about one's partner. Might have to give up on that one. <laughs> I'd have to lose that fight, Ben. It's it's not it's that and dollary dues. I will never let go. I felt the same way as you, Ben. I wanted the Australian currency to be dollary dues because of the Simpsons episode, I and I really so wanted bad. to hear. I wanted to hear finance people say the dollary due is down against yeah. the greenback. 
<laughs> but now they say greenback, right? That shit greenback. is weird. I know. Anyway, I anyway. know. But now anyway. I want sorry, something different. Sorry. I want. I've moved on. I want something different now. What? What do you dollar want? Bucks. Now? I want dollar bucks. Nah, mm -mm, mm -mm. you, oh. you bluey dilettante, you Johnny come lately. <laughs> I, am, I am no dilettante, sir. <laughs> I can show you long dog in any episode you name. Do you know what I mean by long dog? I well, sausage dog or duck sund. Yeah, long dog. Who, who knows? Who knows in chat? What's long dog in bluey? Okay, I'll wait. Let's let's wait for the <laughs> stop everything. Termy's got it. Hidden dog. There's, in many episodes, <laughs> not not certain ones like Takeaway. They played Takeaway today on the ABC. It wasn't in that one, but there's a small toy that's hidden in the background in just about every episode. <laughs> Termy's, Termy, I see that you are a man of a person of culture as well. You found long dogs <laughs> in many episodes. Aaron says Ben's cleaving to dollar dues is one of his beige flags. Touche. That is. I love I love that burn. That is such a good burn. I am a huge fan of Aaron today. So far, he has had multiple cats on his screen, so already a huge plus. Um, mm -hmm. And then making fun of me, but then previously saying things that I agree with. Aaron, you're the best. Ah, there's another cat. <laughs> MVP for this episode. For sure. Okay, number three. We're getting to the top three, although there is a tie for third. <laughs> Feral Cat suggested this one, Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly, <laughs> a humorous or euphemistic term for a rocket explosion. Yeah. Now, this predates SpaceX, and we've got to also point out that even when the rockets explode, the unmanned test, test ones, we learn lots of stuff from those explosions. So even though it seems <laughs> bad, it's actually not you, that you bad. You you can't get to space without blowing a bunch of shit up. Without breaking some space eggs. So, as we mentioned in the episode, it was first used to describe a rifle that was self-destructing, not a rocket. It went through rapid, unscheduled disassembly. Aerospace is just full of humorous euphemisms. You got, you got, to, you got to keep the magic alive somehow, I imagine. Because it would That's be it. super disappointing if you were a rocket scientist and your rocket exploded, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. The other third place was Girl, suggested by Rush and Diego. So. Oh, yes. It took me a second. I was like, what? And then I remembered. Yep. So um, Girl Dinner, a low effort meal. Mm -hmm. Girl Math, logic that justifies impulse spending. Lazy Girl Job, an easy job. And Hot Girl a Summer. What do you think? I like it. I like all of those things. I think they're mm. really fun and playful. And um, if uh, I haven't seen any of them used or been appropriated in a mean way, which I'm really happy about. Mm -hmm. No one, no one's come in like throwing massive angst towards like girl dinners or girl maths or anything. It's it's always been a very fun and irreverent and and sort of playful usage that I've still observed, which I'm stoked about. Mm -hmm. Kara has pointed out in chat that uh, boy guessing is the male counterpart to girl math. <laughs> Although I have to say, now who was it? Hang on, let me just get down to my do do do. Lanika, you found math. Do you want to tell us? Do, is it okay if you tell us about math a little bit? Yeah, is that cool? sure. Yeah, I was. I was just. I've been seeing math in like all sorts of circumstances that aren't even like number related, like. No. Um, boy math is about like uh, thinking that you could land a plane or like <laughs> or fight a grizzly bear or some shit yeah it, yeah it, yep. <laughs> it was this month it was I think I could land a passenger plane in 2019 it was I think I could probably take a point off Serena Williams in a tennis match oh god and all these men were like I, I think I could probably do that no you could not do that that is unjustified that's, confidence <laughs> that's boy math I remember, like, I'm old enough, right, and here's how we can tell that millennials are old, that I remember when I was a kid being a la like being taken into the cockpit of planes. Do you, did, uh, like, do other people remember when this shit happened? Like, it's wild to think to about me. now. But it was like you would just be, like, sitting in your little seat as, like, a five- or six-year-old, and the, stu the, the person would come along and be like, would you like to see where the captains pilot the plane? And I would be like, oh, my God. <laughs> Yes, I would. And they would take you in. And it's just 
wall to wall buttons and switches, right? Like it's it's like the roof switches, the wall switches. There's even like switches on the floor and in front of them. And and the like the the fact that a man of any man could could be like, I don't I could do that. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like fifteen thousand switches in there. How could you anyway, anyway. I love seeing girl expand its reach, but I also like seeing math extend its reach as a kind of, you know, internal logic. You know, there, there could be kid math. And I've got a lot of examples of those. All right. Anything else on that one, Lanika? Are we good? Yeah, we're good. There's so many examples, but no way to go through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We got to keep it moving. Let's see. Um, okay. Now, heading back up in my notes. Doo -doo -doo. All right. So, yeah, girl, a Youthful, lighthearted antidote to grind culture, sometimes in protection of one's own boundaries. Girl, love it. Helen suggested our number two, and that was spicy. Not by any means a new one. But Helen suggested that this was something, uh, I'll, whereas we always have had spicy takes, which are maybe controversial takes, or uh, COVID would be spicy cough or something like that, um, or you could be neuro spicy. Now we're seeing it moving over to in the more sexy side of things. Thanks a lot, you face smut reading folks, which I put I put my hand up as like someone <laughs> who has gotten down on those books. And like I think that's is that where does does anyone can anyone rule on this? Was that where it first started morphing into its more sexual sort of semantic kind of space? Is just in like romance books. I just feel like spicy started out sexy, went away, and now it's coming back. That's that's how I feel. Dustin in chat says, I use spicy with my students when they are being a bit sassy. Sassy. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're up to number one. Okay. Here it is. This one was suggested to us by Lord Mortis. And the word is in shitification it's the because <laughs> language word of the week of the of year, year. <laughs> lord mortis do you want to do you want to come on and tell us uh what how you found this thing and what's going on for you with this yeah so cory doctor um our our blogging cape wearing lord and savior <laughs> um, man of the people <laughs> Exactly. He's, he's, you know, he's a bit of a lefty and he wrote this huge thing about how venture capital builds services in a way that, that basically causes them to become bad for the people that use them and bad for everyone ultimately. And he, the term he coined for this, I believe he coined it, was in shitification. So first Facebook is like, Here's a free service where you can talk with all your friends and we will make sure that you only see what your friends show. And then they're like, hey, stores, you don't need to maintain a website. You can come onto Facebook and just have your stuff there. And, and, and other users, you can just friend with the stores that you want to see. It's all good. Then Facebook is like, hmm, we need to juice the revenue number. So we're going to allow stores to just advertise in people's feed by taking some money. And then... That just keeps rolling on and on until gradually, first the users get screwed because they get this stuff pushed into their feed that they didn't want to see. And then Facebook, when it realizes that no one has websites anymore, just cranks the, the, the cost on the advertising, thus screwing all the stores who no longer have anything. And who wins? Facebook wins and their shareholders win. And, and, and everybody else loses. Yeah. Everybody else loses. Yep. That's a that's a great summary. That is exactly right. People are using it a couple of ways. Sometimes it's called platform decay, but sometimes sometimes we just use enshittification to describe like a lot of things that are just kind of getting worse. I um uh, I want to I want to rep uh, headers here who who like RIP is slowly dying in her bed somewhere. Uh -huh. Um, she she said if this wins, she would would have talked about the fact that email clients and Chrome, the web browser, are both strong candidates for enshittification. And i got to be honest, I agree. So this term was coined by uh, Cory Doctorow. I had the chance to talk to Cory Doctorow. Get the fuck out of here, really? When I, when I found out that this was going to be one of the words, let's hear a bit of this. Now, um, oh, how are you going to do this? Are you going to hold up a phone? No, I'm sharing the video. 
Oh, nice one. We are here with author, journalist, activist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, internet legend, and now wordsmith, Corey Doctorow. Hi, Corey. Thanks for hanging with me today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Looks like your word, the word that you created, enshittification, is the because language word of the week of the year. Congratulations. Well, it's uh, I'm excited by this, um, oh, really? especially uh, given my fellow Canadian uh, Gretchen McCullough's contribution to uh, because as a I don't know what part of speech it is a proposition preposition. Uh, I think uh, I think preposition will be good. Yeah, but, as, is it as no a conjunction? Preposition. Conjunction. I'm getting my conjunction, grammar wrong. That's it. <laughs> I uh, I have written dozens of books, but I uh, am not a grammarian. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things you kind of do on the side, but you don't tell anybody about, right? Mm. Yeah. So tell me about enshittification. Have you noticed that this word has gotten traction, especially this year? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I uh, make up silly words all the time. Uh, I'm a blogger. I've been a blogger for coming up to a quarter of a century now. Uh, and every day I write about the stuff that seems important. It's actually a really critical way to how I write novels and uh, nonfiction books as well. I just have this giant database of everything that seemed important and why I thought it was important at the time. And that that turns out to be a very useful resource to have when you're writing. I, I wrote nine books during lockdown. So th that's how I did that much was, was by having that giant database just sitting there for me. So... Um, Sometimes those words hit, and enshittification was one of them. Uh, it describes a, a process of platform decay, where internet platforms are first good to their users. They tempt those users in. They find a way to lock them to the platform. Perhaps that's with digital rights management or by using predatory pricing to drive all the competitors out of the market. Think of Uber getting rid of all the regular taxis and convincing uh, cities to stop spending on public transit by losing 41 cents on every dollar they earned for 13 years until they'd let $31 billion worth of Saudi royal money on fire and then uh, doing a little rug pull and saying, now taxi drive rides cost twice as much and we're paying the drivers half as much. We're in profit uh, and you don't have any buses or taxis you can take because we did this long con. So you have platforms that are that are good to people. They bring people in, they lock people in. And um, then they take back some of the surplus they gave to their end users and they give it to their business customers. So um, think of, say, Facebook, which started off by promising users that they wouldn't spy on on them and that they would only show them the things that they asked to see, the, the stuff that they'd explicitly uh, asked to follow. Uh, and then at a certain point, just went to the advertisers and the publishers and said, hey, do you remember when you told these rubes we weren't going to spy on them and we'd only show them the things they asked for? We're going to like spy on them with every hour that God sends and cram uh, uh, your media non-consensually into their eyeballs. Um, we'll give you a free traffic funnel for your website. We'll give you cheap ads. Uh, and then once those publishers and advertisers, those business customers are locked in, they withdraw the surplus from them. Advertising gets more expensive. It gets less well-policed. At a certain point, Procter & Gamble zeroes out its $100 million a year programmatic ad spend and sees no drop in sales because most of those ads weren't being shown to anyone. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously publishers find that Facebook just doesn't recommend their stuff anymore unless they pay to boost it. Uh, and yet they've been made into these commodity backend suppliers for Facebook. And so then the, the platform has taken the surplus away from end users and business customers, and it gives it all to its shareholders. And it tries to maintain this brittle equilibrium where things are very bad for all of us, but not so bad that we leave. And that equilibrium often shatters because the difference between this place sucks, but I can't bear to leave. And oh my God, why am I here? I'm leaving now is like one, you know, live stream mass shooting or privacy scandal or, or whistleblower. And then you get the final stage, um, which is when the whole thing turns into a pile of shit, uh, which um, involves doing something uh, that uh, you and I would call panicking, but which tech bros call pivoting. Uh, and the, the pivot in Facebook's case is like, sure, we've spent like a decade and a half telling you that your future is... Um, you know, this text-based message board uh, with your racist uncles. But uh, actually, we were wrong. The real future is that we're going to convert you to a legless, sexless, low-polygon, highly surveilled cartoon character in a virtual world called the Metaverse we stole from a 25-year-old science fiction novel. Uh, off you go. And so 
you know, that really rings a bell. I think lots of things are getting worse for lots of reasons. Uh, we are, I think, in a, a, a late stage of capitalism. The end of the zero interest rate policy has been, um, uh, has, has put a lot of pressure on firms to increase profits or to be profitable for the first time. Uh, there um, are lots of things that haven't come back since the acute phase of the pandemic and maybe never will. And so there's just this enduring sense that a lot of what was good before, even when things weren't good overall, is gone and uh, what's left is slipping away. And so the, the word in shitification really seems to have captured a um, a, a sensibility among many people, captured the the structure of the feeling of the moment, and they lots of people are using it. And I can tell it's catching on because I'm being denounced for it, uh, oh. for for uh, it being simplistic, uh, or failing to, or or being redundant to something else or whatever. And also because um, other people are using it in a very simplistic way, and then still more people are denouncing those people for being simplistic in how they use it. So okay. uh, I know now that that definitely this word has caught on. It certainly has. And I want to talk about those two kind of senses of enchidification, because when you coined it in 2022, you meant something quite specific. You were talking about platform decay and the way that they take... <laughs> They gave us a playground to play in, but then we brought our friends and now they own our friends and now it's sure. too painful to go. Um, but now people do kind of make it mean something a little more general, like a general sense of disaffection with, I don't know, late stage capitalism or the way things are. Um, do you notice that this is gaining traction for more general reasons and not for the reasons that you intended at first? Well, I actually, uh, a, the first time I used enshittification, I didn't mean it in the in this formal sense of platform decay. Uh, I was actually on a vacation with my family, and we were staying in a place with very poor internet. We were um, in a cloud forest in Puerto Rico, in a in a cabin we'd rented, and it was really far into town. And in order to figure out where we were going to eat, we would need to get on the internet. And the internet was very slow. And so we go to um, TripAdvisor and look up restaurants. And the internet in this place came via microwave relay. And microwave relay doesn't work when there's a cloud between the relays. And yeah. we were, I remind you, in a cloud forest, which <laughs> meant that the internet came and went a lot. And um, I would get a TripAdvisor page loaded with, you know, five restaurants in town. And I try to open the pages for each of them. And I go away for half an hour and come back, and the only thing that would have loaded was the uh, favico, the little icon that goes in the yes. tab, which would be yes. rendering in the screen as this giant vector graphic. And eventually, I, I tweeted, um, uh, you know, has anyone at TripAdvisor ever been on a trip? This is the most <laughs> enshittified service I've seen. <laughs> okay. And a lot of people just like the word. And so it just became part of my lexicon. I used it to describe things periodically. And then... You know, I and I think in shittification, like that n prefix, like insistent and cysting, like when something becomes a cyst, gets covered over with a cyst. Yes. Um, that 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 um, there's a there's a nice mouthfeel to that prefix. It kind of it's it's one of those words like ovipositor that just sounds like <laughs> yeah. something really un unpleasant is going on, uh, or blood <laughs> funnel, or you know, like any of those sort of. Uh, any of those words and then and then shittification right like just it's get it so it's it's just a funny way of saying getting shitty there's uh, lots of there's lots of latin going on latin prefix latin suffixes but then you've got shit right in the middle of it and you can't disguise that yeah nice anglo-saxon monosyllable yeah yeah so and it's fun to say it's naughty right like uh, i've heard from many academics who've who've incorporated it into their work and mm -hmm. are quite pleased with themselves for slipping the word shit into a peer-reviewed journal with a high impact factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think a lot of people loved like Henry Frankfurt's book uh, on bullshit, you know, partly because mm -hmm. it's a good essay, but just there's something cool about like a book with the word bullshit on the cover. It's why mm -hmm. we like Penn and Teller's TV series. So, yeah. I, I mean, I get why people are, are um, using it colloquially or loosely. Uh, and I think that it's distinct from other phrases whose meanings have drifted uh, that are in a similar vein, like uh, surveillance capitalism, for example. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people who didn't read Zuboff heard the phrase surveillance capitalism, which is a very good phrase, and said, uh, this is a critique of capitalism. And actually, Zuboff is uh, extremely bullish on capitalism and thinks that surveillance makes capitalism stop working. But if we curb the surveillance, the capitalism would be fine. So hmm. actually a reason that that I, I she and I disagree. I actually wrote a book about this called How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism about the way that, you know, capitalism produces the regulatory capture that produces the platform decay that includes surveillance. Okay. And that a lot of the claims that she makes about surveillance that allows her to redeem capitalism, like surveillance is allowing tech bros to control our minds. Uh, which uh, then short circuits capitalism's ability to aggregate our decisions, which is how we get efficient markets, that um, I don't think those claims are true. I think tech bros claim they have built a mind control ray. I think they're lying. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lee Vinsel calls this crita hype, where you believe someone else's hype, but then you criticize them as though it were true. I don't think it's true. I don't think, I think everyone who ever claimed to have a mind control ray was like, kidding themselves or everyone else or both, you know, whether that's Rasputin or MK Ultra or pickup artists or, you know, Mesmer. So, you know, I, I think that Zuboff is often quite distressed, you know, based on her public uh, pronounce- pronouncements. She's quite distressed about the drift in the meaning of the term surveillance capitalism hmm. and, and about its use as a critique of capitalism itself. Um, I don't feel like colloquial the colloquial use of shitification to describe things that are just worse mm-hmm. i don't think that it it dilutes the the more technical meaning it just becomes uh if anything like a kind of metaphorical use mm. of of shitification you know and and i'm trying to think there's i'm sure there's examples of this where we have a technical term like um like duty cycle like i mm. I, I will often say like Oh, I've I've stopped grinding my coffee by hand because you know my wrist tendons have only got so many duty cycles left in them, and <laughs> right. I want to be able to write books forever. You know, like it's a metaphor, right? I don't literally yeah. mean it in the sense that a mechanical engineer would. Is enshitification inevitable? Is it just part of the life cycle of a company, or is there a way out? Yeah, I don't think it is inevitable. I think collapse is inevitable. I think firms, uh, you know, by and large have uh, run their run their course and lots of people have theorized why you know you have the innovators dilemma and the old mm-hmm. uh, axiom shirts shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations your know, first generation makes it second generation spends it the third generation loses it you know all of these different different ideas i think that lots of firms came and went without in shitifying right cray you know cray mm-hmm. was giant they made supercomputers silicon graphics bought them Silicon graphics failed. That was the end of it, right? Hmm. Um, in shitification is this is this kind of you could analogize it maybe to this thing that we've done with um, uh, end of life care, where people who normally would have died relatively quickly uh, at the end of their life with cancer, um, and uh, who would have just controlled that last month of their life with um, you know, heavy uh, analgesics, opioids mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. now extend their lives by eight months, but spend those eight months in absolute agony and bankrupt their families, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and do not die with dignity. You know, there's there's uh, good work on this in, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, uh, the guy who wrote On Dying. He invented medical checklists, great, great um, MD, uh, surgical checklists. Uh, gosh, I've blanked his name. Anyway, you know, that there's that there's much more pleasant ways to die that and and you know doctors themselves generally refuse this kind of care they 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 don't want it and so right. like we've done that we've done this with companies we prolong their senescence uh in a way that maximizes the harm to their suppliers and users uh rather than having a kind of graceful landing and and it's as though not just that you're keeping someone alive at their end of their life um even as their cognitive faculties decline and they're unable to make sound decisions, but you're leaving them in charge of lots of other people's lives, right? You know, the period in which Mark Zuckerberg was even remotely reliable as someone who made decisions that made other people happy ended 15 years ago, but 4 billion people still have their lives entirely run online by the whims of this, you know, grotesque man-child. Uh, and, and so, yeah, this is, this is the outflow 
of a failure to enforce competition law. We stopped doing that a little, little, little by little in the Carter era. Things got more aggressive in the Reagan era. Every mm-hmm. administration since until the current one has has stepped that up. Today, we are finally at a point where competition law is being more aggressively enforced. It's the first reversal in two generations, and it's bipartisan and global. It's happening in Australia and Canada, the UK, the EU, um, China, and the US. And it's so bipartisan that one of the main antitrust bills in the Senate right now, the, the America Act, which will break up Meta and, and Google, its two main co-sponsors are Ted Cruz and Elizabeth Warren, right? So <laughs> yeah. like, we are definitely at a moment in which people in many places under many political systems and who hold many different political theories are all coming around to the idea that we need uh, market competition even if you don't believe in markets as a way of solving problems, mm. even if the only reason you want market competition is to um, degrade the uh, the you know y- unity of 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 an industrial sector as they approach their regulators and lawmakers and turn them into a squabbling rabble of hundreds of companies that can't agree on where to hold a meeting where they would discuss their lobbying priorities, much less what those priorities should be. Sounds like what we came to with our episode with Dr. Emily Bender on AI and large language models. Hey, what if we enforce the laws that we already have? It sounds like that's what we're coming to. Yeah, I think Emily's completely right. Uh, I think that a lot of the like sui generis rules that people cook up for for new technologies are often um, uh, ill-conceived and start from the premise that we don't already have rules that could manage this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because they fail to ask how it is we're not enforcing current laws, like what are the what are the problems that stop us from enforcing current laws? You know, in, in Europe, for example, they've had a very strong privacy law for about eight years now, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR, but they haven't enforced it, uh, especially against large American firms, because those firms all um, fly the flag of convenience of Ireland, which is a crime haven that attracts companies that want to cheat on their taxes. And any company that um, can fly a flag of convenience can move, right? That's that's what it means to be a company that can pretend to be Irish, is that you could pretend to be Maltese next week. And so Ireland then has to compete with other would-be crime havens to not enforce other laws that corporations would like to not have enforced. And among those is privacy law. And so the Irish privacy regulator hears like 17 major cases a year, unlike the German privacy regulator, which hears like 500, even though Ireland is the notional home to every major tech company in, in Europe. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the, the, it's it's uh, if, if you just make another law and you don't ask what's wrong with our federalism that our existing laws aren't getting enforced, then you'll just have another law that doesn't get enforced, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and and actually, we see with the uh, Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, the, the new tech laws the European Union has just enacted, so they have a different enforcement me- mechanism that streamlines the movement to federal enforcement across the EU and out of these regional courts that are more easy to co-opt. Um, that might provoke a, a, a federalist uh, crisis, you know, um, anyone who lives in America or, or Canada or Australia or any other feder- federation knows that um, the preemption of regional rights by the central government can can be problematic, uh, you know, but but at the same time, like it, it's there, like maybe this will work. Right. So they're learning from it. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Emily is right, that there are plenty of rules that we could use to deal with with A.I., I think that um, there are also regulatory approaches that instead of looking for the individualized element of each problem that we have and trying to make a, a, a narrow rule for each of them that might be so narrow as to be useless and might be so specific as to be quickly outmoded, there's another regulatory approach where you look for the common element among many problems and you then try to regulate o- around that common element First of all, because that gets you a lot of bang for your buck, but second of all, because it builds a coalition of people who care about a lot of different issues. So, you know, I don't think much of Zuboff's surveillance capitalism hypothesis that, you know, big tech built a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners and 
now a billionaire stole it and made your uncle into a QAnon. But I, I think that what both of us agree on is if we enforce privacy law, if we had a good federal privacy law in the United States, which we don't, um, that it would cut off the supply of data that's being used notionally to target those people. Moreover, if you're worried that TikTok is exposing American uh, people to Chinese propaganda, then you're also worried about the collection of private data. That's where the supply comes from. And if you're worried about um, uh, cops, you know, serving reverse warrants on Google and get enumerating all the people who are present at a Black Lives Matter demonstration, that's also a privacy thing. And if you're worried that Instagram is giving girls bulimia because it's targeting them, well, that's also uh, a privacy thing. And so we could just say privacy first, right? Let's all of us who maybe disagree about which parts of these matter or whether which parts of these are even real, but who all agree that if we had a privacy law, these problems would be substantially fixed, right? Like if you're worried that the ad tech sector is usurping money that should go to the news sector through surveillance advertising that accounts for 51% of every advertising dollar being sucked up by the the two big companies, Google and, and Facebook, then let's just turn off surveillance advertising and replace it with context advertising, where the advertisements are sold based on what you're looking at, which is a thing publishers know very well, as opposed to who's looking at it, which is a thing that only tech companies will ever know very well. Hmm. And and now we've got the news companies on our side too, right? Like that I think is a a, a really good approach that um, not just for like the kumbaya reason of building a, a big tent, but also because it's it's like sound tactics. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, hey, this conversation went a lot harder than I thought it was going to. I thought we were going to talk ah. about a word that had shit in it, and we ended up talking about solving a whole bunch of problems, but I'm, I'm really grateful to have your insight. And once again, congratulations on uh, Enshittification, our word of the year. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming on and chatting with me. Thanks, Daniel. That was Corey Doctorow. Amazing to chat with him. What a get. I would say that's a get. So uh, big thanks to Corey for that. And thanks to you, Lord Mortis, for suggesting that word for us. It was uh, really fun to talk about. And it is the winner of the Because Language Word of the Week of the Year for 2023. I would just like to say uh, once again, a big thanks to Corey Doctorow. A big thanks to the team from Speech Docs for transcribing our words all the guests from 2023 and here they all are and if you can remember the episode that they were in and what you learned from it this was this was just a wonderful memory for me we had we heard from mark ellison dennis barron pharaoh cat nick enfield morton christiansen jack grieve emily hofstetter eleanor Bayer, russell gray aris clemens caitlin green ricker dockham helen fraser georgina hayden and diana eads sean roberts and steph rennick Emily Bender, Jack Hessel, Jenny Nuttall, Rob Drummond, Robbie Love, Diego Diaz, Sarah Ogilvy, Nicole Holliday, and Andrew Perforce. Uh, thanks to all of the people who contributed. And Ben, and of course, Hedvig. Ben, I'd like to thank you for being here for another great year of shows. Ah, I'm garbage. Those you're people great. are amazing. They're, you know, they, they're great. <laughs> and most of all, you are patrons who keep the show going. Now, they're not garbage. They are the finest humans that I can Very, find. The, the cream of the crop. I'll start the reads, shall I? Okay, that music you go for it. Has begun. If you are a patron, thank you for supporting us. You can support Because Language in other ways, not just patrony. You can give us ideas and feedback, like so many of the voters and so many of the suggestors, the people who have given us the ideas for the show, they really keep the show going. You can help us that way too. You can follow us on the socials. We're Because Lang Pod on just about every conceivable social platform. If you go to our website, becauselanguage.com, you can find the little speak pipe thing and leave us a voice message or just send us a file by email. That's fun too. Speaking of email, it's hello at becauselanguage.com. Another thing you can do to support the show is tell a friend about us or leave us a review. Take it now, down. Now, obviously, all of the people who are currently listening to this are patrons and you guys are wonderful like i'm f the, i'm sitting in a room digitally speaking with like 26 of these absolute dead set legends but if you're part of the listen later massive if you are time traveling from the future to the now that i am speaking and you are not a patron 
well, you should consider becoming a patron because it helps us do a bunch of stuff. For instance, you can, all our shows get transcribed. So you can be like, I'm pretty sure Ben's used that joke before. Let's see how tired and archaic Ben's jokes are. And then you can just search for all the times that I've said a particular joke and you can, I think Daniel, you've done this to me. You've actually, you one of our favorite bits of all of like, because language dim is when you figured out whether I use a certain word versus another word. What was that one? It was either either and neither neither, which we still haven't had anybody do any work on. So I don't know. Uh, um, so patrons, you help make me look stupid, which I personally think there are very few better uses for money in the world. But you will also allow us to um, give money to our guests so that we're not just like stealing the intellectual labor of people who work really, really hard, which is really good. And um, you, if you become a patron, you can, and you're part of the Listen Later Massive, you can become part of the Listen Now Massive, the Discord server, the live episodes like the one that we've just recorded. That's all coming your way if you get down and become a patron, even just a little, a little baby patron, and you can get all those cool things. I'd like to give a shout out to our top patrons, Iztin, Termi, Elias, Matt, Whitney, Helen, Jack, Ferrocat, Lord Mortis, Grammar Yen, Larry, Renee, Christopher, Andy, James, Nigel, Meredith, Tate, Nazrin, Joanna, Nikolai, Keith, Aisha, Steele, Margaret, Manu, Diego. Sorry for not reading your name out last time. Diego bumped to supporter and I somehow missed it, but here we are. Aria Flame, Roger, Rianne, Colleen, Ignacio, Kevin, Jeff, Andy from Logophilius, Stan, Kathy, Rosh, Cheyenne, Felicity, Amir, the Canny Archer, oh, Tim, Alyssa, Chris, Laurie, Angry Balls, Tig, Louise, Rhina, and new patrons at the friend level, Nick, taking out a yearly membership. Big thanks to all our great patrons. Our theme music was written and performed by Drew Kraplianov, who also performs in Ryan Bino and Didion's Bible. Thank you for listening. We will catch you next time because language. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next year. Pew, 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 pew. Or like sooner, presumably, because we'll have another show that we invite people to. I imagine. I don't, I don't mean in a year. Oh, okay, okay, okay. See you <laughs> in the next calendar year. In now, next- if people want to hang out, I'm going to go see if I can find a kitten. Hold on. I was looking up the word embiggen for reasons, and I wanted to figure out where its sort of contemporary usage can be traced back to. And in the course of doing that, I've discovered, and I probably shouldn't be surprised. We know this, right? Surely it's The Simpsons. It is The Simpsons in its contemporary, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the more surprising thing, or at least the thing that I'm actually remarking on, is not so much where that word comes from, but the fact that Lisa the Iconoclast, which is the episode that it is credited to, has a like five or six scroll long Wikipedia page, which <laughs> makes me think that there's probably one of those for every episode of The Simpsons. And that is delightful. I find that really delightful. That's a season seven episode as well. So it's not like, you know, early or anything like that. That's, that's quite remarkable. Which one was Lisa the Iconoclast? Because I know. The I think that's where thing. she finds out the truth about Jebediah Springfield. I have always disagreed with that episode. <laughs> what? The- and that's 1996. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. What do you disagree with, Daniel? That do you think that Jebediah Springfield really was a, like a man <laughs> of the people? God, no. Friggin remind me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Because it's been like a 70 long time. years since I've watched this. But doesn't Lisa find out the truth about Jebediah Springfield, and then decides to conceal that truth because truth is yeah, for the smart people. Yeah, and yeah, that is true. I can she, yeah, she just... I can see how the the core message there. There's a bit of a grease vibe, isn't it? Like change for your man. She decides that the only way to hold people together is with lies. And I <laughs> now now that you frame it that way, the cynicism have... in in me is it's... like, well, is isn't there some truth to that? <laughs>